Hello, dear friends. Some words of Torah for Yom Kippur. This year we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, fought October 6th to the 25th of 1973. Many of us are old enough to remember the events of that Yom Kippur, how when we came to shul we were notified of a war that had broken out in Israel, about how the Egyptians and the Syrians did a surprise attack, crossing the ceasefire lines on the day that they thought us most vulnerable, the holiest day of Yom Kippur. We were told from pulpits across the world that things were not looking good for Israel, how we had to daven with extra kavana for the sake of our brethren in Eretz Israel. I was only nine years old, but I saw the consternation on the faces of my parents and other adults, enough to know that this was something very serious. During the war, we lost, we lost over 2,600 lives, with thousands more wounded, many permanently, either physically, psychologically, or both. Although initially things were looking quite bleak, Baruch Hashem, we were privy to divine aid, and by the end of the war, the tides had turned. In 1999, Rav Chaim Sabato published his best-selling memoir, Adjusting Sights. In it, he described how he became even more committed religiously as a result of his experiences during the Yom Kippur War. Rav Sabato recently wrote an essay about his experiences after the book's publication. Rav Shimon Gershon Rosenberg, known as Rav Shagar, was a deep thinker and philosopher who passed away before his time at the age of 57 in 2007. He fought alongside Rav Sabato during the Yom Kippur War. Two God-fearing rabbis and friends who were in high school together at the Bnei Akiva Nativ Meir Yeshiva under Rav Bina, filled with tremendous knowledge and depth of life experience, took two very different approaches to the events of the Yom Kippur War, when many of their friends who fought side by side with them did not make it home. Two of their mutual friends from Yeshiva, Shmuel Orlan and Shaya Holtz, died alongside them during one of the battles in Syria. Rav Shagar was in the very same tank with both of these martyrs. He was pulled out in the nick of time when the tank was engulfed in flames. Tragically, Orlan and Holtz did not survive. Rav Sabato was in a nearby tank and witnessed what had happened. Thirty years later, a group gathered to reminisce after, about the war and to preserve the memories of those martyrs. Both Rav Sabato and Rav Shagar were on the panel to share their thoughts. Rav Sabato arose to speak first. And the moderator asked him, What happened to your faith in the war? He recalled that the tank commander shouted to him over the radio, Fire! Fire! They're shooting at us! Sabato! Pray! Rav Sabato exerted all his efforts and shouted, Anna Hashem Hoshiana! Anna Hashem Hoshiana! Rav Sabato then said to his audience, At that moment the secret of prayer was revealed to me. And, a, and the secret of faith that fills all the chambers of the heart. His faith was deeply strengthened by his experiences, and his life completely switched trajectories. But the moderator would not let him be. What of the pain, the fear, the burnt tanks around you? Your good friends, what did it do to your faith? Rav Sabato answered, Every moment my faith grew stronger. I can't explain to you why. Maybe because I saw with my own eyes what a person's life is, and I stood alone in front of my Creator, perhaps from the power of a pure, simple prayer. Everything I learned all my life, everything I read and heard in Yeshiva, concerned simple faith and munapshuta. These feelings of the heart burned within me to such an extent that I remember saying to myself then, I know the day will come when my heart will be numb. I know days will come when I will have forgotten everything. I therefore said to myself during the war, I will write on a note what is inscribed in my heart, and every time I begin to weaken, I will look at it and remember. One of the poems that I wrote at that time was written on a paper that was stained with tank grease, and it read, In prayer shawls enfolded, with palm fronds in hand, Their shelters imploded, no barriers withstand, Earthly refuge corroded, in heaven's shadow, they stand. Rav Sabato used the Hasidic parable to describe his faith at that time. A group of people were walking through the forest on a night that was filled with a deep fog and then heavy rain. The people were totally lost due to the weather, but then a lightning bolt lit the sky. Many looked up at the lightning bolt to admire the beauty of the light that lit up the sky, but the wise ones looked forward as the lightning struck, since the light from the bolt illuminated the path 
that they needed to take to get out of the forest. I saw the lightning bolt of Hashem amidst the storm, concluded the Rav. After Rav Sabato finished, Rav Shagar arose to speak. As Rav Sabato writes, there was a lot of tension in the air and an oppressive silence. His face said it all, struggle, sorrow, and distress. And Rav Shagar said, I listened to my friend's words carefully. It is clear that he speaks the truth. That's how he felt. But I did not feel that way. I've wanted to tell him this for a long time, ever since I read his book about the war. When I saw what happened to my dear friends in the tanks around me, I was beset with terror. It is terrifying to see a life cut short. Shaya and Shmuel, young men full of charm and grace, a chain of purity and un uncommon spiritual beauty, sitting on the turret of the tank learning Gemara naturally and innocently. I understand this terror as the Yira Ila'a, the higher awe written about in Hasidic works. It is frightening because through it we encounter the mystery of eternity, the mystery of life. I also feel this terror towards life itself, this life that continues. I feel like I am living on borrowed time. I am living by God's grace for which, from a human perspective, I can find no explanation. And life is constantly accompanied by deep reproach. How do I live this life that is nothing but an undeserved gift? I remember on Sukkot during the war I thought, the sukkah represents placing one's trust in Hashem, and yet it did not protect us. The Rav continued, We are hiding in the shadows, the shadows of faith. God's providence in which we all believe was hidden in the shadows, not in the light. He is a hidden God. We experienced him through Hester Panim, his inscrutable obscurity. Faith is often found amidst difficult questions, the sort that Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says, there are no answers to. But David already said in his Psalms, Lev nishpar v'nidke Elokim lo A broken and contrite heart, O Lord, you will not reject. God is found inside a broken heart. The feeling of brokenness is itself a divine presence greater and higher than any other. The anguish, the injustice that one may feel in such a situation, perhaps even the sense of shame, actually brings a kind of faith, a deep faith in a hidden God. Silence. Everyone retreated from the evening with a greater sobriety and a greater understanding of how different people process trauma in different ways. Even two people who share the same religious background and the exact same faith that Hashem runs the world. Rav Alexander Ziskind, author of the ethical and devotional treaties Yesod Vishoresh HaAvodah, discussed the duality of function within Yom Kippur. On the one hand, Yom Kippur is a day of great fear, a day when we all cry out, Mi yichye u mi amut, who, we, who will live and who shall die, who in his time and who not in his time. We are frightened by the prospect that this is the day when our fates will be finally decided for the coming year and that we must be serious about our efforts at Teshuvah. On the other hand, there is a more covert aspect to Yom Kippur, which is that it is, it is also a day of great joy, Every moment that I deprive myself of food, drink, leather shoes, and so forth, I should be rejoicing in the fact that I am actively engaged in the service of God, doing the mitzvot of Yom Kippur and having my sins expiated in the process. What a great privilege! What a joyous opportunity! The story is told of a chazan in the times of the Baal Shem Tov, who was in the midst of his davening on Yom Kippur and started to recite the al to a joyous melody. Someone went over to him and suggested that perhaps this wasn't the most appropriate thing to be doing, to sing the al to an upbeat little ditty. The chassid responded, You know, once I was walking around the king's palace, and I noticed the custodian sweeping the palace courtyard. The whole time he was humming a melody to himself. So I figure, if I'm cleaning out my royal courtyard, that is my heart and soul, if I'm purging myself and helping others purge themselves of the schmutz that we've acquired over the year, why shouldn't I be happy at being able to do this? Why not hum a very upbeat melody? As a matter of fact, many holy works point to the verse, Ivdu et Hashem vigilu bir ada, serve God with awe, rejoice in trepidation, as a reference to the contradictory feelings we're meant to have on Yom Kippur. On the one hand, we know that our lives and the lives of our loved ones for the coming year hang in the balance. 
On the other hand, we're grateful to have this amazing opportunity to cleanse our souls and start life anew, fulfilling Hashem's commandments in the process. Rav Shagar's response, I feel, was the normative Yom Kippur-like response to adversity, to the confrontation with one's mortality and the fear and awe of the mystery of existence, God's unfathomable calculations, and the fragility of life. Perhaps he felt some guilt as to why he survived, feeling unworthy of God's graces. Rav Sabato took the Simcha approach, greeting this awesome moment with a renewed faith in God. He saw the flash of lightning amidst the fog, the greatness and joyfulness of a Yom Kippur amidst the terror of it. He realized for the first time in his life what the purpose of life was and how to really tap into one's spiritual nature. For those who survived the Shoah, there were similar, similarly two opposite reactions. Where was God was quite normal, but there were those who found God in Treblinka and Auschwitz on a daily basis. And I quote from an article, an American rabbi, Dr. Reeve Robert Brenner, surveyed hundreds of Holocaust survivors to find out how their experiences had affected their beliefs about God. Dr. Brenner's conclusions were extraordinary. First, he discovered that the horrors of the Holocaust had no impact at all on the religious convictions of a remarkably high percentage of the survivors. Somehow these people had endured hell on earth without losing their faith in Hashem. It never occurred to me to question God's doings or lack of doings while I was an inmate of Auschwitz, although of course I understand that others did, wrote one survivor. If someone believes, b believes God is responsible for the death of six million because he didn't somehow do something to save them, he's got his thinking reversed. We owe God our lives for the few or many years we live, and we have the duty to worship him. According to Brenner's research, about 11% of Holocaust survivors did lose their faith in God. However, the really extraordinary discovery made by Dr. Brenner was that 5% of the survivors in his survey, survey had actually abandoned atheism and begun to believe in God as a direct result of their experiences in the Nazi laboratories of death. You know, over Yom Kippur we're going to recite Yizkar. I ask that you include a prayer for those who were killed 50 years ago to include the memories of the martyrs of the Yom Kippur War in your Yizkar. Recall their holy neshamas, how their sacrifice may, means that we now have the amazing startup nation of the 21st century Israel 50 years later, with incredible prosperity, high-tech, and world recognition. And so, dear friends, may Hashem wipe the tears off of all the faces who are still mourning the losses of that tragic war of 50 years ago. May the martyrs of that war, whose souls glow like the brightest point of heaven, be militze yosher for all of us. May this be the year of ultimate redemption, when no more bloodshed will again be experienced in our lifetimes. May we see it. Bimehira, biyamenu, amen. Gemar chatimat tova. Have a meaningful Yom Kippur.